this is a new one that we've never done before, not to my knowledge. <laughs> and I actually put these together, these slides together. Um, how do we use HiPack in different ways than what we normally use it for? So ancillary uses of HiPack. So, oh, sorry. With that. Does anybody have any other uses for HiPack other than just doing surveys or on a dredge? Multi-beam or side scanning? Use it with uh, ROV. ROV? Okay. And yep. LIDAR. And for, and for LIDAR, right? We're trying to incorporate more quality uh, information with our surveys. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, like what kind of sensors do you have that pertain to the water quality? Um, it's a different section that But you can collect that data. That data is they available. Data is actually from um, Okay. So I figure if they're using Diamond products, ICACs, they've got the issues or some of the kind of data together. Sure. Do you have like an EXO or a uh, Sun or 6600 or something like that? Like uh, that I'm not sure. Okay. But I'm here to sit and listen and okay. So this is going to be more like a general discussion, more or less. So I've got these slides, and I'll kind of show you some of the different ways that we use high pack other than the traditional means that we normally think of. So I want to kind of get your ideas on how high pack can maybe be beneficial to you in other ways. So um, ancillary uses of high pack. Uh, we have little buttons everywhere because customers come to us and say, "We know you can do surveys, but we." We need to position an oil rig out in the Gulf of Mexico, and we need to get it to a precise location. Okay, so we've got GPSs all around the oil rig. I need to position this. How do we do it? So we find the best way to do it, and the best way that we found to position an oil rig is with ghost shapes. Okay, so one of the things that we can do through the vessel menu <coughs> has anybody ever seen this button before? Ghost shapes. Anybody used it before? Does anybody have any, uh, does anybody require a ship or a barge to be in a precise location? Okay. Somebody's nodding, this might be beneficial to you. <laughs> so what you can do is, we have our normal boat shape, okay? And the way this, this works is, you have your normal boat shape that you load right here under the vessel display, okay? And in this case, it's an oil rig. Under the ghost shape, you enable the ghost shape, and then you position the shape based on X, Y, and a heading, and then you can fill it with color. That way you can get these shapes to align and ghost on top of each other so that you're putting a vessel precisely where the location of that vessel is relative to that boat shape's origin point and heading. Okay. So it's all based on how you've set that shape up in the boat shape editor. Okay. In the boat shape editor, it's all made based on XY coordinate system, and every boat shape has a zero, zero coordinate. So what we're doing is we're moving one boat shape to the next as a ghost shape based on that XY coordinate that you define in the boat shape editor and that you define here by XY and heading in the survey program. So that's all done under the vessels menu. <clears throat> this might go quick because there's not a ton of slides, so this is, that's why it's going to turn into a general discussion at some point. Um, we have Survey Viewer. More and more, we're starting to network this whole entire world, and everything is going to be interconnected to some point, and we can use that to our advantage. So we work on a lot of big boats that either have Wi-Fi or have LAN infrastructure on the boat, so you can share the high pack stream across the whole ship as a network type display. It's a survey viewer. So everything has to be on the same network, but we have some tools in the survey program, a remote viewer over the web. We also have another type remote viewer, which is WebIF, which you can look at the survey program in a web browser. So if you know the IP address, of the survey or the dredge pack computer, you can type that into your browser and you can see the dredge pack screen. So that's 
can be helpful for somebody that's away from your project or somebody that's local on your ship. So let's just pretend that the captain in his berth has a network computer down there. He can't always be on the bridge, but he wants to see what's going on. He can pull up the dredge pack screen in his berth because he's connected to the dredge pack computer over a land connection. Okay. Um, these are just some Windows considerations for security. So if these tools for remote viewing don't work, kind of like turn off your firewall type of thing, it's probably blocking the IP in the port. And okay. he can control the control the things. Like he can view on it. It depends what program you use. Uh, the remote the remote viewer over the web, um, you can do some basic things. You can start and stop logging. You can increase or decrease to the next plan line. You can rotate the survey line. So there's some basic things you can do, but you can't take control of the mouse and control alt delete or anything like that. And so it's just going to show you the survey windows. Okay. So this remote viewer over the web, this is found in the survey program. It's under the options menu, remote access, and you need to come in here and you need to enable it. And once you enable, you can specify a port number. So if you have a computer system on board that's being controlled by an IT department, and you have virus protection software on there, this is helpful to be able to user define the port number so you can tell your IT admin, hey, I need you to leave this port number open and available, and this is why I'm using it. You can password protect it as well, and then you can set the screen resolution and the maximum number of users that can be logged in at a time. And I'm really not sure how many maximum simultaneous users. I've done up to three, but you might be able to do more than that. So. I guess it would be a good, a good thing to have if you know, a lot of people will run HDMI cables or VGA cables all over the boat. You know, um, if they're just on the Wi-Fi or have a network cable connected to that computer, you can just use a computer as a viewing screen on one of your vessel. That would be pretty helpful. So it's kind of like um, you know, the Ultra VNC or something like that, but it's specific to our software. So what to do if you have multiple monitors set up? Viewing it just as one, just trying to jam everything on that one monitor. Yeah. Well, yes and no. It's gonna. It's only gonna show you the map window, left, right indicator, data display, that kind of stuff. So you're gonna get map one. You're gonna get left, right indicator one. And you're gonna get data display one on the screen. So it won't be busy. Okay. So this is the interface that you're gonna get. And this is to answer your question. So here's the, here's the survey program running on the primary survey computer, the survey PC. When you log in to the survey computer, you're typing the IP address of the computer. In this case, it's the same computer. Does anybody know what IP address 127.001 is? That's the IP address on your Ethernet card on your computer. It's the loopback address. It's the local LAN address on your computer. So basically what it's showing here is they've brought up in a browser this computer's survey. But if you had a local network, like we all know it at home, where things are 192, 168, 1.1, 1.2 or 3, you would type that number in, colon, and then the port number, and then up comes the web page showing you the data display and the map window, and then some other tools. So, you know, start logging, end logging, um, move to the next line, and then swap line orientation. So you just get you get some basic tools. So it's not a full-on viewer of everything on the PC. It's just a viewer of what's in the survey. It's basic windows. Okay. This is another way to do it, and this is the WebIF driver. So in high-pack hardware, 
this DLL is in the devices folder. And <clears throat> when you run this WebIF DLL, it's the same principle. Um, you're going to run this uh, in a browser, and it's going to have uh, your map window, and then down here with this driver, it gives you more information about your vessel position than the other remote viewer over the web. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have this 3D TV program. Has anybody attempted to use the 3D TV program or the real-time cloud program? Okay. So this can be a little difficult to set up at first, but if you can um, use uh, you know, um, our 3D boat shape editor and this 3D TV program, it works across the shared memory platform in the survey program. The shared memory pl uh, platform that runs in the background of survey is just a block of information that just sits there in the background that we can read. Okay? So we can have secondary programs that read that shared memory block and that can position our vessels with this 3D TV program. Okay? So this is a, another program that can be found in the survey program under the options drop down menu, 3D TV. So if you've gone into the 3D shape editor and you've created your barge or your supply boats in that shared memory block for your mobile, we can position them in 3D space. So this is just an example of a barge, a um, couple of uh, supply boats over here, and this is actually a survey boat towing a, a towfish, side scan towfish. And then the 3D shape editor has buoys and other default shapes. So we have some default shapes already included in HiPack. So when you install HiPack, those default shapes load. Uh, and then you can see how they're formatted in the 3D uh, boat shape uh, program. Okay. Uh, I guess the only th okay the only other thing I could add about this is there's two ways to track the th vessels in this 3D TV window. Uh, you can lock on to one vessel. You can make one vessel the primary vessel, and it'll keep the focus on that one vessel. And as it moves, it'll keep the camera on that vessel. Or you can do a free form flight of it and take control of it and move it around with your mouse and give the aspect that you want instead of it tracking. <clears throat> okay. Um, we use um, HiPack for dredge quality management as well. It's just another use. So, you know, we not only do DQM stuff, but we can do a bit of metadata, and there's some other ways to compile information to get to the owner, which is the Army Corps of Engineers or another government agency, or if somebody just um, simply wants uh, a string of raw data in spreadsheet format, we, we can get all that information, okay? And for people that don't know, don't know DQM is dredge quality management, and we have device drivers in HiPack that send it out in a government format that they can use. Okay. Uh, typically, this requires you to run another computer on the vessel, and it's the government computer that takes the information from HiPack, displays the information about the vessel and some production information, and then, uh, and then it goes out over the internet to the Corps of Engineer DQM. Okay. We also have mission planning and line steerage for USVs. I call them RC boats. Um, but we, we have device drivers for that. And we can collect and control the boat. We can tell it how to steer, where to steer to, and where we're at. And Sea Robotics is one of our customers, and this is one of their uh, USVs. And this is a little dark to see up here on this projector. But what this is showing you, and you have this presentation, I wish I could get the room a little darker, but we have a couple of different drivers for the two most common 
type of USV line steerage and control systems out there. Uh, we have a Mavlink driver, okay? and we also have a Sea Robotics driver. So depending on what kind of boat you have, uh, it shows over here the Sea Robotics driver that we made, and the Sea Robotics boat using this driver is collecting um, multi-beam data. Uh, it see if I can if I can see it's even hard to say see here um, yeah you might have to look at this it's even hard to see here but, so. so we can uh, <coughs> collect the data either on board the vessel or remotely log it okay so if there's a connection to the boat fast Wi-Fi connection to the boat and your laptop is on the shore we can collect it there or if there's an onboard PC you can start logging on that PC and that's where the data will be. Okay. So we work in the four dimensions. We've got towfish. We can position towfish. We have water quality on a USV. We have ADCP stuff sing and single beam data or multi transducer data. <clears throat> and then we've got drone, and I'm not sure if you've seen our payload. That's something that we had just now started to offer. And that payload package can either be put on a drone or it can be placed on your vessel. And it has a computer on board and a Velodyne laser and an SBG, and it logs everything on that payload. Okay. So you can do everything underwater, on top of the water, or in the air. Uh, I see this a lot in Florida when there's marine construction going on everybody wants to monitor turbidity uh, turbidity is an important thing for us because if the turbidity is up the job will shut down and that's one of the criteria that specified in the plans and specs of the job um, we have some drivers that will do live turbidity monitoring if you have the if you have the right sensor <clears throat> the YSI EXO uh, can graph and plot this turbidity and those parameters that that sensor can read. And like anything else, it's a device driver. So for this one, it's a multi-parameter probe. You can have these different types of sensors installed on that probe. And with this YSI 6600, you just specify the 10 parameters you have. So we have temperature, conductivity, salinity, all the way down to turbidity and chlorine. So this is a real time, time series in survey showing the turbidity over time. And then it's also logged to a raw data file <coughs> that you can process after the fact. So that you can plot or contour or colorize turbidity because everything in high pack is treated as a depth, okay? So when we collect high and low frequency single beam data, it's depth one and depth two. If you collect magnetometer data, we treat magnetometer data as a depth. It's a gamma reading, but we treat it as a depth. It's a value, okay? Same thing with this driver right here. We treat these parameters as a depth so that you can open this raw data file that's collected these parameters in the single beam editor and be able to process uh, these fields, turbidity <coughs> over time or temperature over time. And then you could take and you could make a temperature heat map in the TIN model program. Okay? So that's a different way to use high pack which you normally wouldn't think of. We think of, hey, we're going to contour depths. Hey, let's contour conductivity. Let's, let's contour turbidity. And that might give the owner a little bit more warm and fuzzy that we're doing the right things out at the job site and that we're not, we're not in an environment where uh, turbidity is a problem, okay? Um, so these are just some of the drivers and some of the tools to be able to do that. This is a neat little uh, feature in the manual tides program. Does anybody make tide files still? Yeah, we all make tide files from time to time. This manual tides program will actually go out to the NOAA Tides and Currents website 
And if you know the station ID, every NOAA station has a station ID. The manual tides program, if entered the station ID, will go out to that URL and pull either the actual or predicted tides into the manual tides program. Okay? <clears throat> And you can save that as a TDX or a TID file and apply it to your raw data to correct your depth. Or you can use that file if it's predicted with one of our tide drivers. We have a tide driver in HiPack that can read a tide file. So if you have a predicted tide file, you can run the tide file driver in hardware and then while you're running survey, it's going to give you the time for that tide as a corrector in survey. Okay? So if you're in an environment where you don't have real-time tides, it's a pretty good cheat code. <clears throat> okay, we've got this NOAA Tides DLL and it will directly read the tide level from a NOAA server and apply it to survey or dredge pack. So it's one step further than that previous driver that I just talked about. Okay. So it's a real-time input into the survey program. And just, just to make you aware that survey or dredge pack is the survey EXE program. Okay. They're using the same program. Okay. The custom boat shapes in survey. This is one that I made real quick. I just went out to the internet and just found a little rescue boat and uh, there's a way to use a bitmap as the boat shape in survey. There's a couple of things that you have to do to make this work, but it's really simple. Okay. has to be a bitmap. You have to make a text file that's in the same folder as the bitmap. There's two lines in the text file that accompany this bitmap. The first two values in the text file is the pixel X and Y. You hit enter, you go down a line, and the next line is the vessel length. <clears throat> so, to find this information out, I'll open this bitmap in the paint program, and wherever you move your, hover your cursor to, it will give you the pixel X and Y down at the bottom. And that's what you're going to type into the first line of the text file. Then this boat has a length, that'll be the next line. So let, I'll give you an example. I think I've got one here. Just a, I actually made this in paint okay, and saved it out as a bitmap. So if I open this with paint, down here at the bottom left hand corner I've got my pixel X and Y. So for this vessel I needed to seek out an origin point and it's going to be somewhere right here where the arm connects to the body. So I noted that XY pixel. And then I went out and measured this so I knew how long it was going to be. So I made a text file, and that text file is the same name as the bitmap, just .txt. And it's a real simple file. You just take the XY from paint, the origin, and this excavator body is 25 feet in length. Okay? Because no matter the size of that bitmap, what HiPack does is it expands or contracts the shape of that bitmap based on the size that you specified here in this uh, text file. All right. So these maybe aren't the prettiest shapes in the world, but 
Here, here's what you can do. Does everybody have a drone in here? Everybody's got a drone by now, right? Okay. So what I've been doing is when I go out to these uh, dredge sites, I don't really do it for boats, but I have, a, I have a small little drone, and I'll fly the drone above the dredge. And with the drone, I can take a picture of it. I can make that into a bitmap. So I'm, gonna, I'm giving the customer now a custom boat shape of exactly what their dredge looks like. Okay? So, Mark, I, you're going to do it, aren't you? <laughs> oh, you going to do it? Okay. Yep. So it's just a nice way to kind of spruce up your experience with the survey program. Okay. Uh, rig moves. Okay. We talked about this a little bit with the ghost shapes. And um, we, have, we have a rig and anchor handling routine in here. So with this routine, what you're going to do is you're going to create a boat shape and you're going to put anchors where they're located on your rig. So in this example right here in the boat shape, you've probably never used it, but you've probably, everybody's seen it. We have anchor points down here. And you place the anchor points here at the anchor locations. And then in the survey program, HIPAC knows where those anchor points are, and we can find out information about these anchors. We can drop anchors, we can raise anchors, we can see how far that anchor has been laid from its origin point on the vessel to see how long that anchor is. And we can also find out information about the bearing to that anchor from the takeoff point. Okay? So, it starts here in the boat shape editor. Okay, I guess I already explained that. So. Okay. So if you want to use this, the basic driver would be a positioning device, GPS DLL or POSM VDLL. You'll also set up an additional mobile and you're going to add the barge DLL. And the barge DLL is going to do all the heavy lifting on the anchor and the rig move. Okay. So um, specify where these anchors are going to be placed on the seafloor. You need to know the X and Y of where they're going to be dropped, so that we can uh, give you information about how far we're away from those anchor positions. Okay. So this is the interface in high pack hardware where you define where you want to drop the anchors on the seafloor. So you go to the driver setup and just type in the X and Y. Okay. And then it will be used in survey. Okay. So we're logging this. And the reason we use this is they take a rig offshore. BP, Exxon, they have all these oil rigs. Well, you have all the captains of these supply <coughs> tugboats and then you have the people on the oil rig. The people back in the office need to make sure that that rig was placed and anchored in the right position that the engineer specified. So what this does is it saves all of that information about where those anchors were dropped in real time to a file so that they can have the information about X, Y, latitude, longitude, time of where those anchors were dropped. <clears throat> so you have the, you have the, the uh, see the final position and the current position overlaid on top of each other um, in the survey program. Okay. And you have some transparency options and you can set the color to differentiate between the two. Okay. We'll kind of skip through this right here. And this is just, voila, kind of how it looks. If you're interested in this, it's a little bit more complicated than what we're showing here in the PowerPoint presentations, but I can get you a sample project if you want to be able to simulate this in the office. Okay. Barge management. This is something that we're doing more and more of because Wi-Fi radios and being able to put land infrastructure on a construction site or a work environment is becoming easier and easier with uh, long distance Wi-Fi radios. Um, I do it a lot down in mines. Florida is, uh, we have a lot of mines in Florida. You just think we're beaches and Disney World. Right in the middle of the state, we have some of the largest phosphate mines in the world right here in Florida. And we have some ginormous dredges in these ponds. 
Um, so we have the operators of these machines that uh, not only are paying attention to what they're doing in front of them, but they've got work boats all over the pond. And they're coordinating people from shore out to the dredge or for handling anchors and setting anchors for the dredge. We can put a GPS and we can put a Wi-Fi radio on every vessel so that all the positions can be shared on a map screen on the mothership. Or it can be, every position can be seen from the screen of a tugboat, okay? <clears throat> so what we do is we set up um, the different vessels. So in this example, we have the main barge and then we have four tugboats. So to set this up to where they can all see each other, each vessel and their respective computer has to have a unique IP address and a different subnet, okay? And that's how we map it, and that's how we'll find the other vessels on the network. Okay? This is just some window stuff. Um, you don't need to be a networking guru to set this up, but you do need to be able to interact with the um, LAN device on your computer and get to the TCP IP v4 settings to give each computer a static IP address. Dynamic IPs aren't any, any good in, in, in this because if you're latched on to something that's going to change tomorrow, you're not going to see the vessel. Okay. This is a sample configuration of how that's going to work in high pack hardware. You set these vessels up with different mobiles. So each mobile will have a GPS DLL. Okay. So the GPS DLL um, is being used, well, each vessel will configure a NEMA output DLL as well. This is great for science boats as well. There are big science or exploration boats where you need to share <clears throat> you need to share position from a GPS to like a mass uh, uh, like a, a different type of sensor, a magnetometer, or uh, if the scientist has a device that he needs to tag with latitude and longitude and time. Um, we can send the positions over a network with the NEMA output DLL. So the NEMA output DLL in HiPAC hardware is just an output driver. With that driver, you specify the type of connection that you want, which is a network, UDP or TCP, and then you give it a user to find port. Okay. This is the NEMA output window. You don't set this up in survey or dredge pack. This window pops up in survey if you load the NEMA output driver. So in the survey, you can turn this stuff on or off real time on the fly. So it's a great way to be able to test that the output is working by turning this stuff on and off. But you have your position messages, your heading messages, depth, and you have some, some other miscellaneous like VTG or um, some of these autopilot type strings that we can output as well. Okay. And that's one thing I don't want to forget. I want to talk about the autopilot driver because that's kind of cool. Okay. <clears throat> if you don't limit the update rate for the NEMA output driver, it's going to kick this stuff out pretty quickly out of the port. So just kind of slow it down and maybe just give a one hertz output out of the port, you can limit the update rate and down sample it to once per second, thousand milliseconds. Okay. So if every vessel has each tug or main vessel GPS DLL and NEMA output, you're receiving the information in on the GPS DLL on these mobiles and you're sending stuff out on the NEMA output driver. Okay. And that's what this says here. On the barge, we'll use the GPS to read in the position from the tugs. And with the NEMA output, we're sending it out. It used to be called something other. You, we used to have pitcher and catcher. And that was the way that you would share positions across the vessels. Uh, but this is, this is the new preferred method because it's just really easy. Everybody mm -hmm. uses the GPS DLL anyway. Everybody knows what NEMA is, and it's easy to find that driver. So this is just an example showing that 
we have the main barge and we're tracking four different GPS systems. And that concludes the PowerPoint portion of this. So we went a little quick, but there wasn't much to this. This is a new topic that we've done, so I want to turn this into maybe just a discussion, or maybe I can show you some settings in HiPAC that maybe you weren't aware of. Um, I can start with the autopilot driver that I was talking about. Does anybody own an autopilot? Did you know you can go to West Marine and buy an autopilot for about 2,500 bucks that will work with HiPAC? so that your boat will have autopilot and can be steered along the planned line. Okay. If you want to do that, that would be a, that's a, <laughs> it's a little complicated. You're going to have to get a mechanic involved and figure out the hydraulic and the steering link, linkage and everything like that. But <laughs> They have them now where um, the autopilot, you can sit with a remote in your hand and steer, steer the boat, which is kind of neat. But if you want to use the autopilot, it's the auto PDLL on HiPAC hardware. So you come into here to HiPAC hardware, and you'll select autopilot. And not every autopilot is the same. There's different manufacturers, and they require different types of <coughs> input messages okay, for them to work. And we've pretty much covered all of the basis on the standard autopilot messages. But they're all here in the autopilot, auto P driver. So these are the output messages that we're going to generate in HiPAC in survey, okay, to tell the autopilot, you know, where we're at relative to the plane in line, so that it can make decisions on how to stay on line. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these are just standard alarms. I'm not going to go into that. Everybody can kind of figure out what alarm is, but. I wanted to go into the multiplier. So if you are using an autopilot, you buy one, you install it, you use the autopilot driver. Um, based on the length of your boat, the type of motor you have, how the steering linkage is installed, it's not gonna work right off the bat. You're gonna have to do some testing because um, when HiPAC tells the autopilot that you're offline five meters, how aggressive is that autopilot going to be to get you online? So if it's offline five meters, it's not going to snap perpendicular to the line, drive the line, and try to follow it again. So we have some multipliers in here so that we can control how gentle we tell the autopilot to steer. And that's what the multiplier is. So I just wanted to just mention that. So if you do buy one, you're going to have to do some basic testing and those are the buttons that you're going to have to use to get it kind of dialed in. Okay. On the autopilot, now typically an autopilot on a fishing boat or whatever offshore boat is tied into your the GPS. It's all floating on the boat. Shifting offline, you know, five, ten meters before it's registering that you're offline. Right. So if you do have RTK on the boat, it's going to make your autopilot more accurate. So you probably split that GPS off into your autopilot with a NEMA message over a serial cable. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. So instead of instead of feeding the autopilot your Garmin GPS, feed it your pause MV position and then use the autopilot driver and then the positions that it will receive will be the, the accuracy of your RTK. Questions, concerns, things that... Okay, let me show you another little trick. Does anybody do topo? Topo work? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Do you ever collect topo data with iPad? You do. You walk around with a computer and you have a GPS and... LIDAR. What's that? LIDAR. LIDAR. Okay. What if, you, uh, what if you were just driving along the beach and you wanted to take topo shots with your GPS antenna with high pack? You don't, but you can. Right. So, for the people that don't know, 
you can use it you can use the GPS in a slightly different way so instead of the GPS computing the water surface elevation for us because we know the height of the GPS antenna if you're in RTK mode we can treat the GPS minus the uh, minus the rod height as a depth. So the GPS DLL has a function as of depth. And you can come down here to the GPS DLL. And then uncheck tide as a function. <coughs> Leave depth checked. And there's one more thing you gotta do. So not only do you have to check depth as a function, you have to come in here into the setup and under the advanced tab, you're going to report antenna elevation as depth. Let me give you an example of this. Um, we have some people that will go out, they have a tablet, it's in front of them and it's connected via Bluetooth to their rover. And they're walking the shoreline because they want to map the shoreline. Right? If you don't have depth checked, and you only have tide checked, you're not going to be able to display any data in the single beam editor because you don't have any depth records even though you logged a raw data file. Does that make sense? So if you want to do topo with that, just make sure you do those two things. Depth as a function and then check this, this box right here. To further that, while we're in the GPS DLL, and because the GPS DLL can do a lot of different things that are neat, <clears throat> I can have two GPSs installed, one used as position and one as heading. Does anybody have old GPS receivers laying around that you don't use anymore? Okay. Like old AG units or old Trimble 4000s or something like that? Okay. It's really helpful to have heading on your vessel, especially when you're in environments where your GPS antenna is not right over your transducer and you're crabbing, right? The position of your sounding is going to be off. So what we can do is we can take two GPS receivers and we can use them to calculate heading. Okay? So if you want heading on your boat, you can get it with the two receivers by adding two GPS DLLs the first one being used in the traditional sense as a positioning device and then adding a second GPS and unchecking it for position and check off only the function of heading and to make this work you need to go into the setup dialog under the advanced tab and then use only for heading checkbox active the OTF gyro on the fly gyro is what that stands for. And now it's going to play the two positions from those GPS against each other and, and compute an azimuth that we can use for heading. Okay. Is there any questions so far? Any of that helpful? You guys already know that stuff? And if you've got RTK, it needs to be RTK for the heading. It does not. If, if you're in standalone quality, it's going to compute heading as well. So it, if you have a position, you're going to get heading. It'd be nice if both antennas were in RTK mode, you'd get the most accurate heading. And also, the further you got those antennas apart, the more accurate it's going to be because there's a longer baseline that can calculate it. What's the minimum? Well, um, meter? I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a meter, a meter like three meters probably. Is there any, you can then mess with it. So is that just like if you're going to continue your lines on the shore, is that the idea behind the topo? Um, it's still running high back. I do the topo too, but I would like it, except for it's kind of cumbersome to carry the computer. Um, so I just want to take it over, collect all my data, and bring it in. Yeah. You know, with an XYZ file. Yep, yeah. that's helpful that you can do that. Yeah. Well, we use it. Well, I use uh, Trimble Business Center for a lot of my RTK stuff.
struggle that we haven't completely converted over to everything in life after this is great helpful things for me because I do incorporate you, I do look for things and put it in the right path because I do blue lines when I come across, take the points when I'm on the shore. Um, we do uh, water elevation at the water line uh, to, to check our tide, check the caretakers uh, day reading. We do a lot of checks with that so we like a couple of shots of outside the water that verify that stuff. So okay. Yeah, well, now I know I can do it on the pipe back there. Right, you can still. We start with keeping everything together in one area instead of having two different programs. Right. The last one I did, which was pretty neat, is um, my wife won a Surface Pro in a raffle, and I stole it the next day. <laughs> and I took it out into the field, and uh, these these new GPS antennas are Bluetooth. So they were they were doing they had their data collector on the rod um, with their it was a Trimble unit. So on the pole they had the antenna and their data collector, and we were walking along the beach. But I could I connected to the GPS receiver over Bluetooth with the Surface tablet, and I was able to run HiPack and get that position from that GPS antenna. And then I knew what the rod height was, so I set that as my vertical offset for the GPS DLL. So I logged right alongside the guy that had the data collector so that I, I didn't have to do a, some conversions or anything like that. It was just, it was in the raw data file. as was uh, points. Sure, I missed something that's different in HiPAC, but this is something new. So, if there's anything you'd like to see HiPAC do, please bring it up to us. We'd be happy to talk about it, maybe even add it if it's something that's very useful or would help your company and your, your agency. What do you do then on your um, on the GPS? That's coming in, of course, under the NAB 88. difference between NAVD 88 and your Great Lakes data constant everywhere? No. It varies. Yeah, the transformation that no one has to see exactly what it is, where you're at. Right. So what I would do, you can probably get that data as points. The separation value is points. Can you get an XYZ file of the difference? All over the Great Lakes? Yeah. Yeah, and if you can give HiPAC that information in an XYZ file, so it's XY um, Great Lakes datum versus NABD88 difference as the Z, you can take that point file through the TIN model program and then kick out a KTD file, run the geoid model, which will get you to NABD88, load your KTD file, which is the difference between Great Lakes and NABD88, and now you have a corrected water surface elevation to the Great Lakes data automatically. And it's just not going to be a single point offset. So it'll be, a, it's just a surface. KTD file will just be a surface. Okay, any, any other questions or comments or? Does anybody use HiPAC in a really strange way? You know, we have some people that have these. Uh, has everybody seen the, the Ross system, the multi transducer, the booms, the, the sweep systems? You know, it's like a multiple, multiple, multiple transducer system. There's a lot of different type of drivers that we have. <clears throat> One thing that's helpful, I'm, I work in tech support, so I, I, I hear it all, you know. I hear a lot of problems that we have and, and questions also. S specifically um, about device drivers. So one thing that's pretty helpful for people is, you know, 
it can be kind of a, a pain to find out what these drivers do. Does anybody have ever have a problem figuring out what a driver does? Yeah. Getting it to work. Getting it to work. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have this list down here that has all these device drivers. They're all DLLs, but um, what does the capture driver not do? Well, for instance, I can tell you what the capture driver does because because I know what it is. It's it takes anything that comes across your port, it records it to the raw data file. <clears throat> so if you have a special string that's not read by HiPack that's coming across the port, this capture DLL, I'm gonna add it, this capture DLL saves the data from whatever port you specify. Well, how, how do you guys know that? How do you know what the capture DLL does? Well, over in the documentation folder, we have these common driver notes. Does everybody know this existed? Okay. So this common driver note document, this PDF, is great because you can search for it. Oh, I hope captures in here. Yep, capture DLL. trying to show you that if you don't if you don't know what a device driver is or what it does this contains all the drivers we have and all the connection information like uh, I guess an easy one to do would be GPS DLL Just gonna find them all. right here so this documents everything that the GPS DLL does tells you the format of the raw data that's being logged from the GPS DLL to the raw data file. So anything that we know about the GPS DLL goes here. Same thing goes for high sweep. The high sweep interfacing is nice because I actually refer to this all the time and I'll just go down to some random one, okay, R2Sonic 2024. We get calls and people go, well, what's the, what should I, I can't talk to the R2 Sonic. How do I get it to work? I can't remember everything. So I'll actually go in here to this document and I'll go down here and go, well, this is the default IP address for the R2 Sonic. And I'll just tell the customer, you know, 10.0.1.102. And if there's any other pertinent information in here, like how to set my network card, how to get true picks to work and all that good stuff. I use this as a reference all the time. I guess at this point I'm just giving you tidbits. <laughs> Where was that at again? Yep. It doesn't look like very small. Yep. So. It's under high pack documentation. It used to be under the help folder, but at, uh, maybe 18 or 19 we started putting it in the documentation folder. Okay. So we've got high sweep, side scan, the common driver nodes, which are all of our DLLs, and then uh, this is one thing too. People ask, well, what changed between 2018 and 19 or 19 and 20? This documentation folder has, it has the program that's been updated and it lists everything that was changed in that program. So if you're looking for new features, in HiPack, this is going to tell you the new features that we've added without having to look at these PowerPoints or what's new or hear it from us. It's all documented here in the documentation folder. So these, there's quite a few here, maybe 30 or something like that. <clears throat> okay, this is just for the Q3 update. So we released 2019. And we had a Q1, Q2, and Q3 update. This is the difference between Q2 and the Q3 update. So all of those things, we've fixed something or we've added a feature uh, 
and we document it here in that PDF. Okay. Well, if anybody has any more questions, I'm going to stick around for a little bit and chit chat. Otherwise, I think that you know concludes the ancillary uses of iPads. They're random class. <laughs>